Good morning, everybody. You ready to get started? Bright and early. When I say good morning, what are you going to say back? Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, everybody's ingested some coffee, so at least we're on our way to our day. Uh, I'm Kirk Rich. I'm the current president this year for the CCM Georgia chapter. And we have a lot of guests here today, so thank you guys. Uh, Georgia chapter is about 300 members strong. We're actually one of the largest and strongest chapters in the country. And we have, um, we have a lot of people to thank for that, a lot of people that are great members that are very involved, and also a lot of sponsors, which we'll be thanking in just a few minutes. Uh, before we start, we've got a very good program ahead of us, uh, emerging trends with some extremely impressive panelists and a great moderator that we'll introduce them in just a moment. But a couple of announcements. Uh, we have our next meeting March the 12th. And our location is still a little bit up in the air, but we're working through that. We are going to do two off-site meetings this year, so we're not in this room every time. And that meeting we are working on, we had a great idea, which has come to fruition, but we've had a little bit of a backup as of last night, or a hiccup. So we're working through that. So be watching your email, and we'll get out some blast about where that location will be. It'll be a lunch meeting on March the 12th, and we'll have it somewhere in Midtown or possibly south of the city. So those are the only two things I'll tell you, but two very interesting programs that both would be very different. And then in the fall, we hope to do another off-site program, which will probably be somewhere connected to the stadium or the Georgia State uh, redevelopment of Turner Field, depending on what happens with that. So stay tuned for that one as well. And then the other, the other meetings will be um, here and will be uh, you know, structured very similar to today. Then on uh, March 2nd through 5th is the first 101 class, and all of the classes that allow a CCIM to obtain their designation happen here in Atlanta, which is very unusual. Most cities around the country, you have to travel to get some of your designations. And people like V. Van Patten, who got his designation last year, uh, you know, the advantage is you can do every class in succession here in Atlanta and work through it very rapidly. So that class is March 2nd through the 5th. It's coming up. Registration's online, but we also can help you. So if there's any question or need for assistance, see one of us after the meeting, or always feel free to give me a call, and I'll direct you the right way. Uh, then on March 22nd, we have our CCM meetings in Chicago. This is our national meeting. We have two of those a year. So anyone that would like to participate with that or the plans to go, please let us know, because we actually do a chapter dinner a regional dinner there where we get all of our regional chapters from the southeast and we enjoy a very very nice and uh, get to know each other better then in april there is no chapter meeting so we are going to take a little break in in april we're actually making a point of lessening the number of meetings this year so we up the quality of the meetings so we'll be having about six meetings this year with again two of those being off-site then April 4th through the 6th, we have the 102 class, which is the second class in the series, and again, here in Atlanta. And then on the 16th through the 17th of April, a fun event, we're gonna join the Alabama chapter down in Destin uh, to learn a few things, but also drink a little bit at the wine festival and sit on the beach. So uh, it's uh, one of those moments where we actually get out there and have some fun. Uh, and hopefully it will be swimsuit weather. We can get out, drink some wine, and hang out on the beach and get to know those people even better. Uh, Alabama has a very good chapter. We're also inviting other regional uh, groups down, so it should be a good time to network with folks in other states and cities. Then in June 11th, we're doing the site to do business training. I know there's been a little bit of an upheaval in our system within CCM with the mail bridge. Mail bridge was stopped in lieu of upping site to do business stdb that um, training will be june the 11th it'll be a full day uh, and we will have an email out very very soon this just got scheduled two days ago it'll be at the commercial board building and we'll send out an email that'll give you all the specifics uh, about that but i urge you to please come to that because the only way to utilize that properly is to be trained there's a lot to it and I think once you go through that training, the, the change of what we've been through in the last year with Mailbridge to that will seem very, very logical. Uh, then we will also, as we pointed out earlier, thank you to the sponsors. The sponsors are what keeps our lifeblood here. Uh, they're the reason you have coffee and bagels in your hands. Uh, so the platinum sponsors this year, thank you to Marcus and Millichap. 
Bull Realty, The Simpson Company, and Kitchens Kelly Gaines uh, Attorneys. Then on our silver sponsors, it's Adams Realtors, Build Right, Commercial Real Estate Show, Commercial Experts Incorporated, First Colony Financial Corp, National Property Inspectors, Standard Landscape, Stout, Kaiser, and Hendrick, LLP, Strategic Exchange Advisors, Signature Bank of Georgia, and Excelligent. So thank you very, very much to those guys. Now, let's get to the program. So today is about emerging trends, and we have a um, very good panel. Several of them are my friends. And then Sarah, who is the executive director of ULI, uh, is going to be our moderator. So Sarah, you ready to do it? Great. Good morning. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to start by bringing up our terrific panel. Um, while they get situated, I will give some brief introductions. You probably know a couple of these folks. Um, really terrific group of talent to talk about not only emerging trends, but what they're seeing here in Atlanta, across the country, and as you'll hear, um, across the globe as trends may be impacting us in, uh, in the real estate sector and in the broader economy. Um, first is, is Chris Hall. Chris is a senior vice president with Haddow & Company, um, a longstanding Atlanta firm that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, Chris is a, has been there since 2002 and is a graduate of Kenyon College, holds his master's in real estate and urban planning. Um, and I got to know Chris through ULI. We served on the technical advisory panels committee. And then I see him mostly around the neighborhood um, either running or riding his bike. We live in the, the same part of town, so, um, so you can, can look for Chris out on the roads. Um, next to Chris is Dr. Eloisa Clementich. Uh, Dr. Clementich is the Director of Business Development with Invest Atlanta. She joined Invest Atlanta in 2011 and has really a phenomenal background working in economic development at the national level as well as in the state of California for Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, and really just fascinating experience that she's brought to, uh, to the Atlanta economy. Um, she has recently returned from India just on Saturday where she was, ex we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that, but looking at um, the economy and the, and the, the impacts and, and really also from an individual's perspective. Um, I was telling Dr. Clementich that I've kept up with her on LinkedIn and on Twitter um, and was really impressed, and, and I hope I have this right, the, the role she played in the repositioning of the Flatiron Building downtown and the Microsoft and the women's entrepreneurial um, space that's going in and just bringing terrific new life to, to that space. Um, and next to Dr. Clementich is David Loby. David is a principal with Noel Consulting Group, where he has been for six years almost. Um, and David uh, does market, financial, highest and best use type work. Um, he brings to that experience he has, one, from the private sector. Prior to Noel Consulting, he worked with Morseburger Group. Um, you may be familiar with Morseburger originally was going to be the developer of what is now Ponce City Market. Um, so he worked on that in its prior incarnation as well as interesting infill projects around town, downtown Lawrenceville and so forth. And prior to that, David and I worked together for maybe five years at Robert Charles Lesser and Company. So um, terrific group of panel uh, panelists and we look forward to hearing from them. I thought I'd start with um, maybe just providing a framework for the emerging trends. My background is similar to two of these folks in that I spent a lot of my career doing market financial, financial fe feasibility for real estate development. Um, and one of my favorite publications every year um, was ULI's Emerging Trends in Real Estate. And it was, you know, if, if you love numbers and if you love analysis and if you're one of those people who gets really excited about those sorts of things, um, this I think is one of the greatest resources to sort of be forward looking about what's, what's coming down the pike, um, how our economy is positioned relative to other economies. Um, and this year it was expanded. So Emerging Trends was um, conducted with over 360 in-depth interviews with real estate CEOs, folks from the capital market sector, and then over a thousand surveys from across the country um, so that they could really dig into what's going on. 
um, and what people see as the, the issues and opportunities going forward. So I thought I'd share like any good you know, publication, it's sort of a top 10 list. Um, so to kick us off, I thought I'd share what was identified as the emerging trends for 2015 by ULI National. Um, I will not do it David Letterman style and start at the bottom. I'll start with number one um, because we won't go through all of them. But the number one trend that ULI has identified is the 18 hour city comes of age. So, so what does that mean? Um, 20 years ago, ULI said, you know, capital investment is going to be in 24-hour cities. Those are the, you know, international gateways. It's Miami, it's New York, it's San Francisco, it's Los Angeles. And then a few years ago, you heard them start talking about the 18-hour city. Um, I started thinking, I wonder what hours that actually is. Is it 6 a.m. to midnight? Is it 7 a.m. to 1 a.m.? But, um, you know, it's places that have life that aren't just 9 to 5 um, and that have that vibrancy, not 24 hours a day, one of my colleagues said, you know, you can define a 24-hour city by if you're looking for some obscure beauty product at 3 in the morning, you can go buy it. Maybe you can't do that in an 18-hour city, but you can probably get it up until about midnight. Um, and, and, and what's interesting is in looking at where there's appetite for investment, there are about five cities that jump into the top 10, maybe top 11 uh, lists that haven't been there before, and they're all what you would call 18-hour cities. It's Austin, it's Charlotte, it's Denver, it's Raleigh, Durham, and at 11 is Atlanta. Um, Atlanta went from sort of being well down the list in the lower 20s to up to 11 um, for investment in 2015, which is, which is really encouraging. Um, and that's also based on the data. It's based on job creation in the city where the metro takes its name, so city of Atlanta, city of Denver, um, technology growth, population growth, and then you know, how each sector is performing. Um, so that's number one, the 18-hour 18, 18 city comes of age. Number two is the changing age game. So you can open any paper and hear about the impact of the millennials. Um, we've all spent our entire careers following the baby boomers and the pig and the python as it is, as it's going through the, um, going through the buying life cycle. But you know, we are reaching a point that there are more millennials than there are of their baby boomer parents. And, and there was some thought that maybe that group had sort of peaked and we weren't gonna see as much impact uh, in the multifamily sector, but you know, the, the con most of the analysis shows that that impact is really yet to be felt and that that's gonna be a significant impact in 2015 and in the coming years. I'll touch on you know, three more of the top 10. Um, the one that took me by greatest surprise, um, labor markets are trending toward a tipping point. We are two to three years away from a labor shortage in this country, if you follow historical patterns, which feels shocking compared to where we've been, right? Um, you know, how could we possibly be in a labor shortage? We're already in a skilled labor shortage, um, skilled labor, labor shortage, um, but we are two to three years from an actual labor shortage. So the conclusion from that is that jobs are going to be increasingly chasing people opposed to people chasing jobs, right? Simple supply and demand. Um, real estate's love-hate relationship with technology is going to intensify. And really, um, you know, real estate, conventional wisdom is we've been slow to adapt and adopt new technologies. Um, the line here from emerging trends is, uh, is love it or lose out. When you look at the impact it's having in the industrial sector, uh, the retail sector with same-day delivery, uh, when you're looking at co-working office space and, and the impact it's having there. And even, you know, I was talking to a developer in, I believe it was in DC, who said even the impact they're having to think of in designing their multifamily properties for space to deliver large packages, because people are in this sort of constant buying, you know, Amazon Prime mode and, and, and how all of that's gonna ripple through the whole system. Event risk is here to stay. Um, everyone's sort of pricing in an assumption that we're going to have unanticipated major events that will impact the markets. Um, and then I'll skip down to what is number eight, uh, infrastructure, time for the U.S. to get serious, question mark. Um, and you can follow all of the, the writings recently about how we're thinking about tackling that here in Georgia, but really it being a, a broad issue across the country that we've been underfunding our infrastructure. When people were asked, you know, what types of infrastructure do you mean? It was roads and bridges, it was transit. I mean, it, it was all transportation related infrastructure that, that's the greatest concern of a, of a risk to our sector. 
Um, and then finally, keep an eye on the bubble. Uh, that's number 10. You know, folks are, are cautiously optimistic, uh, sustaining momentum, but taking nothing for granted, right? We've, we've all come out of a tough sector of, of the, the cycle, and, and folks are feeling encouraged, but, but are taking nothing for granted. Um, so that's a highlight of the emerging trends. If, if you're like me and you love to dig in and see how Atlanta ranks on every single property type, and um, if you want to dig into some of these trends, you can actually access this online. Just Google Emerging Trends 2015 and, and you can pull up the PDF, but I have a couple here if anyone would like one as well. Um, so with that, let's turn it over to our panelists. Um, Dr. Clementich, you've just returned from India. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you see some of these trends uh, playing out in Atlanta and maybe what you see on more of a global perspective of, of trends we may not be thinking about that, that we should kind of keep our ear to the ground for based on some of those experiences? <clears throat> well, one of the biggest things, well, first, good morning. I apologize. I am a little congested. It wasn't India. I, I was back on Saturday. I actually got sick here at home <laughs> um, after I stopped taking all that meds. But anyway, so, so I just wanted to um, apologize for the murmur. But So India. India was a great experience for us. I had never been to India. I had been to Asia and Latin America. So it was a good opportunity to, to see the market and to see the economy. If there's one thing I, at the end of the trip, asked the question is, is India ready for Atlanta or US investment? And I think that with the new government, with the Modi government and the BGP, BJP party, what we'll see is changes in policies. And until some of those policies get changed, then really, unless you're in it for the long term, India um, may not be a market for you. It would be good if you are in it for the long term to get in early, uh, because then you can get some of your market share and make a presence there. But if not, then it's not going to be a go in, get get rich quick kind of market. They have several laws. For example, one on the book, which I was surprised on, is if you're a company and you go to India and you invest and make millions of dollars, you cannot take that money out of the Indian market. It needs to stay there. Uh, that is one of the things that they're looking to reform and change, but that would definitely have an impact on business. Uh, so I would just say I, I solved some of those issues. And then they're talking about some of the same issues we're talking about. Infrastructure is a big deal. Water, electricity. Um, they still depend very heavily on coal, pr being able to get water throughout all parts of the country. Uh, they have a lot of people. Um, and somehow I learned that there's some disorder in the, there's order in this disorder. It was very different the way they drive. They, they do not use blinkers or their mirrors. <laughs> um, but, but those were interesting things that I learned. Excellent. Um, so in real estate, you know, you, some folks in, in all consumer products, folks will say, you know, it's all about demographics. You follow the demographics and, and you know what the demand is, you know what the opportunities are. We talked about the changing age game as being um, sort of trend number two. And you know, maybe starting back in the fall, we started seeing some articles. I think one was in the New York Times um, that said Atlanta isn't as attractive to recent college graduates as it used to be. Um, I saw one maybe yesterday that said we're number one for college graduates. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, sure what the truth is. But I just maybe starting with David and working down, you know, what's your perspective on how well we're competing for that demographic? And if we do have some issues, what do you think um, in the real estate sector we need to be doing to, to better attract that group that's key to our economic future? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting topic with the market research work that my firm does. Um, you know, my, my answer is yes and no. We, we are seeing them and we're not seeing them. I think uh, in the past five years or so coming out of the recovery here, we, we haven't seen them as much, but we're just now starting to see the millennials come out in certain locations throughout the metro. I mean, it's true, everything you hear about them, they're looking for more mixed use environments, walkable environments. And we're starting to have an increasing amount of those in the city and in some suburban locations. You look at like, you know, Avalon's mixed use deal, you look at Bucket Atlanta, Pond City Market, you look at all the different environments that are being created by the Beltline. And so those kinds of communities, when we're doing our research and we're talking about the demographics that those new product types are seeing, that's where you're seeing these new millennials come in. You're not seeing them in other locations in the metro. And I think one of the challenges that we have is we're doing pretty well at creating those environments that they want to be in, 
but I don't know that we're doing as well as we need to be on creating the product types. We work around the country and we're looking at other major metros, whether it's DC, Chicago, LA, these other environments that we're competing for this same demographic. Um, they have a much higher percentage of attached product, whether it's urban infill townhomes, or I know condo is a four letter word still these days, but smaller condo buildings that you can finance. Um, and we don't have as much of that here in Atlanta. And that's gonna be an important issue, particularly with preserving affordability. Um, not only are the millennials looking for kind of low maintenance turnkey type product, but in many cases it's a way to get in at the proper price point. So I think that's a big issue that we need to focus on. You know, um, ARC just released a study, it was done by Burning Glass, and what it does is it looks at how many postings, actual job postings in certain areas. And you see from 2007 to 2013, there's an 83% increase in postings in Atlanta. And this is twice the national average. And so we see that there's a big interest in attracting these type of millennials. And then you look at what jobs or what clusters the biggest ones are, Inter internet secur security, wireless mobility, health IT software, with the two biggest areas being digital media gaming with over 24,000 postings in 2013 alone, and software development with over 22,000 postings. Now why do I say that? Here in this group, who thinks that Java is more than just coffee? <laughs> like who knows Java, really? Do you, do you guys know Java? Oh, wow, I'm impressed. How about Oracle? SQL? Oh, wow, I'm impressed. Um, the reality is what we're seeing is that these are the skill sets that people are needing. And these type of skill sets usually tend to be in the, we're seeing in a lot younger than millennials are carrying this. So what we're seeing is this trend of new and young folks coming into the city and we see it continuously. So I would just echo what David said on the type of housing they're interested in. That would be our opportunity. But we're seeing that they're coming to Atlanta. Chris, any, anything to add? Uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job, um, I, and I, I did read the Emerging Trends report. It's okay. dense, but I recommend everybody <laughs> read it. But in the in the report, they had a section where they project over the next five years what's your um, capture rate going to be of the millennials, and or what's that cohort going to grow at? And Atlanta actually fared pretty well, so we're we're expected to attract that cohort at a, a fairly impressive rate over the next five years. We were below Raleigh and Charlotte, which you know. I tend to think Atlanta's a cooler city than Charlotte myself, but um, apparently they're going to catch more of the millennials moving forward. But we were also above cities like uh, Denver, Houston, and Dallas, and even, uh, even Nashville. So we're doing pretty good. I mean, we're not at the top of the list, but we're certainly not at the bottom of the list. So I think it's a little overblown to say that um, we're not doing a good job of attracting this uh, demographic. And one of the things I think that um, is helping us with that is a lot of the stuff going on with Georgia Tech around Tech Square and just some of this collaboration you're seeing between industry and the university. We're doing a lot better job of keeping, I think we're doing a lot better job of keeping our talent here in Atlanta than we used to. A kid would come out of Georgia Tech or Emory um, if they were, and they would go to Silicon Valley or to Boston or somewhere to get a, a tech job. Well, a lot more of those tech jobs are being created here in Atlanta. So I think we're doing a lot better job in that respect of uh, not only attracting millennials, but keeping them here in Atlanta then all the quality of life things that, that David mentioned, the Beltline, um, the new housing in town. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's an energetic and vibrant place to live. And just, you know, one thing when you're out just driving around the city, if, you just, if you're just looking, you know, just using your eyes, one thing that tells you we're doing a good job, you drive down the Edgewood Avenue corridor. I don't know anybody who's, if anybody's driven around that corridor recently from downtown out to Inman Park, you dri drive down that corridor five or six years ago, it was desolate. You drive down today and it's just it's peppered with restaurants, with little, little shops, you know, the streetcars running there. So we've definitely made the investment and the effort, and I think it's paying dividends. So I think Atlanta's doing a good job. So one, another thing that surprised me in this report is, you know, when they survey the 1,500 folks across the country, you end up with this ranking of how each market is doing by, by property sector. And Atlanta ranked highest for single family development of all of the property sectors. That's not one that we're hearing a lot about, right? We hear a lot about, you know, are we overbuilding multifamily? Is there demand for office in this submarket or that submarket? You know, Chris, you've been doing some work in the ownership sector, whether it be condo or single family. Tell us a little bit about where you see us in that cycle and, and what you think the opportunities are. 
Well, we had nowhere to go but up in the single family <laughs> sector, um, you know. So one stat that I like that we use in our work is over the last six years, we've permitted about 9,000 single family units per year. The previous six years, we were doing about 51,000 single family units per year. So we're moving forward at a much more measured pace, which I think is good. We're seeing, you know, home price appreciation. If you look at the Case-Shiller data, home prices are going up. It's actually started to, the rate of increase has started to slow down, but they're still going up. But it's very uneven across the metro area. For example, we were just doing some work up in Johns Creek, and up there you can't find, you can't find uh, land. Developed lots are selling for $120,000. And, um, you know, it's just a very tight market. Builders are trying to find developed lots, and there's just not a lot of them. Contrast that with South Fulton County, where we're doing some work. It's still an investor market. People are going in buying developed lots for $10,000, a fully developed lot. And um, there's not a whole lot of new home construction going on. And it's, again, it still hasn't, it hasn't gravitated to that area yet. You know, areas like East Cobb, uh, South Forsyth. I mean, the residential market is back in those areas. But you go to some areas of South Fulton, you go out 20 to Rockdale, to Newton County, you still got tons of inventory of developed lots, which um, you know, it's going to take some, a long time to work through. So it's a, while the single family market's recovering, it's a little bit of an uneven recovery. Mm -hmm. On the condominium side or the in-town the in market, we all know in-town townhomes are hot. I mean, people are jockeying for land. You know, groups like Pulte are going out and assembling, you know, 12 single family homes, knocking them down and developing back with townhomes. Um, so the, the in-town condominium market is very healthy. On the condo side, which uh, we do a fair amount of work in, people are talking about doing projects, but as David alluded to, it's, it's difficult to get them financed. Um, so where we see the opportunities on the condo side is in um, you know, smaller 60 to 80 unit buildings um, that, and you've really got to underwrite them as either rentals or condominiums. Um, that's what lenders are requiring. But uh, it's just tough to get a condo development off the ground, but I do think there's opportunities for smaller condo buildings and niche buildings we're probably not going to go back to what we were seeing last decade when you're seeing these projects like Metropolis, Realm, and Eclipse, these 300 unit buildings. That's probably not going to, that's not going to lead the recovery in the, in the condominium sector now. It's going to be these smaller infill niche buildings. David, anything to add based on you're doing some work in the, the condo sector? Yeah, I was just going to add, um, I think uh, Chris is absolutely right. I mean, it's it's difficult to finance these, and so I think some of the requirements that are being put now on condo deals, particularly around the pre-sale requirement, if you're going to get a lender to even talk to you about this, it's going to require the Atlanta market to sort of shift how we've been dealing with condos. In the past, we haven't been much of a pre-sale market. You can go to other cities like Toronto, for example, and 50% of their sales are in the pre-sale condition. So developers and builders have learned that they have to spend a lot more upfront in their marketing, build out of a sales center, building out a full model unit to really prove what that experience is going to be like to the buyer and get them comfortable with that pre-sale uh, condition. And I think we're going to have to see a lot more of that if people are going to get condo products through. So shifting to economic competitiveness, we talked a little bit about infrastructure, um, but Curious, Dr. Klementich, what you see as our most critical infrastructure needs from an economic competitiveness perspective, and how optimistic you are that we can begin to address those in 2015. Well, talking to the companies that we're attracting and looking at those in my, in my pipeline, the biggest conversation has been circled around workforce and the workforce trends, and will they have a pipeline of talent to fill their jobs? And so that has put us right um, center with the Workforce Development Agency, which is now being led by Michael Sterling. And we're really excited about some of the changes that have been implemented in the Workforce Development and us working together very closely so that we can identify very quickly a program or some sort of training that would be available to support the business's needs in the future. And really looking at it very strategically so that no matter where you are within the pipeline, that we would be able to help you find the job and then also fulfill the, the employer. So for me, the biggest thing that we've been hearing from companies is the workforce and yeah, accessibility. Yeah. So we're certainly in an exciting time in real estate development in Atlanta. I don't recall a time that we've seen as many large-scale opportunities between the selling of city assets with underground, with Civic Center. Um, anyone at the Midtown Alliance annual meeting earlier this week? A couple hands. 
they put up this graphic that showed what the Midtown skyline would look like if all of these projects went forward and you know it was 20 some odd red towers and um, it really just tremendous energy tremendous opportunity um, so I'm curious and, and maybe David start at the end you know what do you think the city could look like in, in five years and, and what issues or opportunities um, or any red flags per se that, that you think there are um, that we need to be addressing sooner than later? Well, I think one thing that we're gonna really see a shift on is you'll still always have your sector, your cohorts that wanna live right on Peachtree in a shiny new tower but I think particularly with the millennials, we're seeing that focus on more kind of walkable neighborhood settings. And I think that's what's igniting a lot more development in areas like Inman Park, Old Fourth Ward, Midtown West, and starting to get more of that kind of neighborhood base. And I think, again, Beltline, I think, is helping to drive that. And you're going to see that open up some other pockets of the city that historically haven't seen that. So we'll see a lot more growth in those kind of areas and a lot more diversification of the product hopefully comes with that. Um, I think, um, you know, one of the challenges that we have along with that is Atlanta's history of kind of nimbyism. And we have to get everyone to understand why density in the appropriate places is a good thing and why it's important to attracting the millennials and building the workforce for Eloisa to go out and recruit these firms. So I think that's a, a big thing we have to be careful about and as a region start to embrace and understand better. You know, one of the interesting conversations I had was I went to um, the Bucket Coalition and we started talking for the very first time now. I've only been here four years, so it's the very first time for me, put in perspective, four years. But about workforce housing and the need to be able to allow the dry cleaner, the person who works at your dry cleaners or the Starbucks worker to also live in areas like Buckhead and Midtown and how there's a lack of workforce housing. And I think that was the first time that we're trying to really address this question about We've been talking about live, work, and play, but if I can't afford to live in Buckhead, and yet that's where I'm working, how do we address some of these issues of ingress, egress out of Buckhead, mm -hmm. and could this possibly be a solution? And I think that has been an interesting conversation for us, and that we've really started to think about how can we promote and support workforce housing in a, in a creative and different way that we haven't been doing before. Excellent. Yeah, I would just echo what they just said about the affordability is a big issue. I think uh, one positive thing is MARTA developing around their TOD stations. They have an affordability requirement. So if you're going to do multifamily housing at a, uh, a, at a transit station, you've got to have, I think it's 20% of the units affordable, which I think is a good thing. It brings more affordable units into the city and places them right on top of transit. Um, also, you know, some of the TAD money um, is being used for affordable housing. Post just got a, a TAD had money from the west side tad and they have to do i think affordable housing units as a as a as a part of component of that project so that's good and these are these are good requirements to require affordable housing i think on the infrastructure issue i was happy to see that there's a i think it's a 250 million dollar uh, referendum coming up um, to pave streets to improve sidewalks roads and bridges in the city of atlanta i think that's a big deal and hopefully that will uh, that will pass it needs to pass and um, I think, you know, one of the issues for Atlanta still, I think, is connectivity. I know you, people are always harping on it, but I'll just give you a simple example. In, in my neighborhood, I live less than a mile from the Tanyard Creek, uh, the Beltline segment, but um, I have to take my life and my kids' life in my own hands just to get over to the, uh, to the Beltline from where I live because there's, there's just not sidewalks, the, the bike lanes, you don't feel comfortable riding your bike. So while we're building some of these assets in, in town, we've still got to provide better accessibility to get from where you live to the Beltline or from where you live to, to work. So those are some of the issues as I see it. And I'm going to jump in out of order here because I thought of something else to add to this conversation um, around the affordability issue. In other markets where we're working in, other urban markets, we're seeing an evolution of the product type where it doesn't just have to be deed restricted affordability. It can be uh, naturally you know, market driven affordable product and what I mean by that is you know, the increasing trend of things like micro units, junior one bedrooms. Uh, and we're seeing that in other markets. We're starting to see Atlanta pick up on that in certain areas. You know, we're doing micro units that are 300 square feet, and there's actually, believe it or not, examples of that in Atlanta now that have done very well. Um, we're doing two bedroom units that are 800 square feet instead of the historic, oh, it's got to be 1,200 square feet. 
And the reason for that, again, it's largely driven by millennials. If they're in the right location, as long as they can get to that affordable price point, then they'll trade off a lot more in terms of square footage or in terms of what's in their unit. They want that lifestyle experience around them. So I think there's a lot more that we can do, and some of it's even code issues that we have to change to be able to allow some of that product type. It goes with townhomes, too. I mean, we do you know, 16-foot and 15-foot wide townhomes in other cities. We don't have that in Atlanta hardly at all. So more of that product to, to get that affordable price point. Yeah, I remember when I had a conversation with Midtown, um, Novare Sky House, we have an affordability component on that unit. And they kept saying, well, are we, I'm not sure we're going to be able to fill those affordable units. They, they still have a waiting list. So. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> All right, well. Let's open it up to questions from, from the group. Got about 20 minutes here. All right, down in front. We've talked a lot about Okay, knock on wood, that trend will continue. <laughs> um, yes, I, my pipeline continues to be very robust. I have a couple companies now that we're talking about. Uh, we're pursuing headquarters very, very aggressively. So hopefully that will be just the beginning. And I just add to that from a trend too, um, and it goes back to the same lifestyle issue that I talked about in the residential world, but we're seeing it on the office side too. And you know we're doing a lot more work on creative office space, and it's just showing that uh, it's, it's being driven by the workforce and this competition for talent, but tenants are starting to recognize they don't need to be in the tower on Peachtree Street anymore. And they're looking for these lifestyle environments where you can go out to the restaurant for lunch, you can go to the bar next door for happy hour, the coffee shop, you know, et cetera. And it's, it doesn't work just having the you know, place in your building like, you know, no offense to this building, but the join us deli doesn't really cut it. You know, they're looking for more authentic experiences. And so um, we're seeing that start to shift the office world. We work with Jamestown and we just did an internal paper for them on the future of the office market and it's not towers. So it's really interesting to see how that's gonna play out in the market over the next few years. Which is really ex why we think that the south, southern part of the city of Atlanta will have a potential to grow because that's where we have a lot of these older buildings and I think if we do some investment and we plan to with our infrastructure bond that this will really be an opportunity for growth on the south side. Excellent. Yes. housing affordability you look at the emerging trends and Atlanta is very affordable like you say at a, at a broad metro level but when you when you drill down to the in the urban core it's um, you know we do have an affordability issues we've talked about and it's driven by a couple things one is, is land costs are, are going up construction costs are going up so in order to to make projects economically viable you've got to you know you've got to charge a higher rent or units have got to sell for a, you know a high price and that's just, uh, I mean, that's just a tough issue to deal with. But um, like David said, some of the solutions are thinking outside of the box and creating smaller units, um, both in the townhome and the rental side, so that employees from NCR that are working at Tech Square can find an affordable place around their, where they're working to live. But um, not only is it a policy thing, but it's also a creativity on the developer side to, to make it happen, but it is definitely an issue. But I think it's important to keep in mind, too, as Chris said, I mean, it's all relative. So metro-wide, we're still extremely affordable versus other metros out there. And the same holds true for our in-town versus if you talk about in-town D.C., in-town New York, in-town L.A. I mean, we do deals in those other cities, rental deals that are four, five, six dollars a square foot rents. We're just breaking two dollars a square foot rents here. So a lot of the workforce is very transient as well these millennials they're they're going from city to city so they're coming down from dc or chicago and they're saying wow these rents are nothing these are cheap this is half what i was paying up there 
So it's a relative situation. So we still can compete very well. That's still an advantage we have over a lot of these other cities. And I would say that we also have a, a variety of different um, projects. So if you guys are familiar with T-Square, which is a new one right by Georgia Tech, this is going to be, we deemed it the dorm incubator, where really you're going to be able to live, and but it will also be your incubator in the same location. There's only three other of these in the nation, Stanford, Florida, and us. And so we're really excited about what that will draw as well. So looking at specifically targeting the millennials into what they like and being able to live, work, and play all in the same unit and not even have to leave your the place you live to be able to have your startup. Jim? Uh, I have a question about what your thoughts are about the downtown area of Atlanta, where you see the trend is for the city, and how do you fix, if it needs to be fixed, to make it like downtown Charlotte, or up, you know, uptown area of Charlotte? Um, well, one positive thing, obviously, is the announcement on the underground. That's been a real you know, sticking point for downtown for a lot of years. Not only is getting it into the private developer's hands good from a financial standpoint for the city, but it'll just, you know, it'll just lift up that, uh, that whole area. You know, keep your fingers crossed that the, this deal happens because it is very ambitious what the developer's planning, but it would definitely be a huge step in the right direction. But I think downtown's got a lot of positive momentum. We were, I worked in the Hurt Building for 12 years, um, starting in like 2002. And it just, the, the evolution of downtown, I mean, it is a, a markedly better place today than it was 10 years ago. And you can point to a number of things, mainly Georgia State's expansion was, has had a huge positive effect on downtown. But what's happening now is we're starting to see where it's really lacked is in housing. And we're starting to see housing um, sprout up in downtown. The Post deal, Paces Properties is building 325 units. Um, so that's really gonna uh, be a real boom for downtown. And then also the area around Centennial Olympic Park with the attractions, the opening the Civil Rights Museum. I mean, that's a, that's a very strong area. But there's still a lot of opportunity in downtown. Uh, there's still a lot of underutilized buildings. Um, so there, so it's, it's got a, I think it's got a bright future. Whether it ever becomes you know, downtown Charlotte or not, I, I don't know. But um, it's light years of where, ahead of where it used to be. To focus and concentration on investment right now, also with all the area communities around the stadium, uh, you have the streetcar, the connectivity to the Beltline. We think that there, all of these concerted efforts is really going to drive the the improvement of downtown, and we're going to see it thriving. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what uh, What do you see uh, around the, the more northern and outer areas of the metro um, as far as the trends of growth? You have so many people traveling into the core, uh, so that, of course, um, is a need for the, uh, the infrastructure to change. But what do you see about growth, development, workplace, um, uh, live workplace, development outside? I'll jump on this one. Um, I think uh, I think it's a lot of the same trends. And what's interesting is a lot of the developers that we work with they're now all very nervous about the pipeline in town and so you're seeing them start to look out to suburban town center or walkable environments that's why you have avalon that's why you've got the new deal going across from the forum you know we're working with swanee and figuring out how to develop more product around their town center so you're gonna continue to see that i mean there's folks that the, the trend is to be closer to your job. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to live in town. If your job is out in these locations, you want to be closer to it, but you still want that walkable environment. So it's creating that same uh, feel in whatever location you're at, getting that right mix of jobs, variety of housing product, and experiential retail. You know, one of the issues uh, in, this, in some of these suburban areas is zoning. It's very hard to get multifamily zoning. We just did some work in Dunwoody, and you know they basically said, okay, you know, we, this is the, the site we were working on. They labeled it on their future land use plan as a transit-oriented development area, but they're not going to allow apartments. It makes no sense. And um, I hope nobody's an official from the city of Dunwoody here, but it um, needs to be said. And I think that is one of the real challenges in some of these suburban areas about creating these live, work, play environments is some of the nimbyism and some of the, the zoning challenges. And you know, one of the issues I think for Atlanta moving forward is this balkanization, everybody wanting to create their own little municipalities so they can control their own zoning and land use. That I think is, uh, I think that's a, a negative trend. 
And um, so I think the zoning challenges in these suburban areas is one that needs to be sort of addressed at a regional level. Yes. Just a quick question for the doctor. Uh, underground Atlanta's kind of grabbed the headlines, you know, from the redevelopment of Atlanta. What's going on with the Civic Center, you know, repurposing that property? What's, what's the latest on that? So what we've done with Civic Center is the prices that we received on the three bids that we, well, the, the bids that we got, the three bids we received, the prices was not as high as we wanted it to be. So now we've gone back out and asked them to, the three companies that have bid, to rethink or re analyze whether this is their final offer. And so we're currently in that process right now. now. Based on the numbers, can you share kind of the vision that the different groups had for the site? Are you allowed to do that? Well, no, I don't think I can, but they're, because um, <laughs> we're still in the bidding process, I don't want to mess it up. Uh, so probably can't get into specifics, but they, they range from focusing on uh, movies and theater and new, new sites for auditoriums and apartments. And Sorry, I can't be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll come back and I'm on tape, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was just referencing sort of ULI provides five best bets for 2015. Number five was don't give up on the suburbs, differentiate between the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and the first sentence says a lot of interviewees say the, the urbanization trend is oversubscribed and there's so much more opportunity to rediscover opportunities in the suburbs. And, you know, that just speaks to um, you know a lot of trends that I think think we're seeing uh, throughout the suburbs of Atlanta um, but I was laughing that number four I don't think I've ever seen you be this direct it says develop industrial two words right um, fourth quarter was the most robust industrial absorption in Atlanta's history do I have that right um, you know, David, maybe just come down the line. What, what do you see as sort of trends in that space? You know, the impact of uh, the Savannah Harbor expansion and, and what we should be looking for in the next few years in, in industrial. I'm, I'm not a huge industrial guy, so I don't know how much I can add to this. But I do know from work that we've been doing with the Beltline, there's a big focus on urban manufacturing, but also the sort of um, last mile transportation logistics and there's huge demand and opportunity for that if we can find the right locations and I think there's a lot of areas in the south side of the city that still have pretty strong infrastructure connection to to 7585 and you're gonna see a, a big focus on that for job growth in the city it's it's not just all white-collar jobs there's huge opportunities there as well so for the, we've seen a lot of activity. We have two locations in particular, Southside Industrial Park and the Atlanta Industrial Park, and we've been getting a lot more interest into those locations and this advanced manufacturing is what they're calling. It's a very much more, it's not, ma it's not labor intensive, but more high, high technology, um, taking advantage of the last mile proximity to the airport is crucial. And so we've been seeing a lot of interest in there. And we, we have been supporting that because it, they do require the jobs that they do hire are skilled or trained jobs. Doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have a bachelor's degree. And so this is important for the health of our economy as well. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add, but I just think, I think in 2014 we absorbed like, I've, I've read figures anywhere from 17 to 20 million square feet of um, industrial space which is the best year since like 1998 in metro Atlanta and you know we have all the inherent advantages from an industrial standpoint in the southeast in terms of transportation and Hartsfield um, so I think that's going to be a real strength of our economy moving forward and you look at the development activity um, you know it was all in the multifamily sector now you're starting to see spec office uh, development the industrial side there's just a, a lot of development activity going on not just build the suits but speculative um, development. So I just think that that's going to be one of Atlanta's uh, real strengths moving forward in the next five years is on the industrial side. Yes. Uh, on that note, as a lot of the industrial around the Beltline in particular is being repurposed for other uses, is there a, a danger of losing the in-town industrial? <laughs> David, I, I would say uh, yes. And we're really concerned about that. In fact, every single time uh, we get a request or we see that there's a, a request from city council to or to change the zoning on industrial to residential we most of the time are against it um, 
just because there isn't that, I think that's only 2% of what we have left is for manufacturing. And so the reality is how do we maintain, since we know that's gonna maintain some jobs for us. So we're trying to reach a balance. Yeah, I just add to that. I mean, we're doing Beltline's real estate action plan right now, and that's a big focus is uh, relocation and preservation of those jobs. So it, every time they have to balance out the highest and best use and the impact that a redevelopment of one of those sites could have on the TAD values with the potential loss of those jobs. And so I think a new component that they're going to be focusing on heavily is trying to get both. So let's redevelop the site if it really is going to help with the TAD, but let's figure out where to relocate those jobs and keep them within the Beltline uh, tax allocation district. And so you have uh, a lot of underutilized land and existing structures, particularly on the south side. So a better inventory of what we have down there and understanding the needs of these firms that might be getting displaced and matching them up to try to keep those jobs. Any one last question? Then I just ask the panel, what, what haven't we talked about? What, uh, what's anything that sort of, you know, you're scratching your head about or, or any trends that, that you're advising your, your clients or your um, constituents about uh, that, that this group should know about? So one of the things that well, I've been focused on a lot is how do we help promote and keep the millennials here? And, and I know that there's not going to be one magic bullet that's going to do it. And so we've been th really looking at it as an incremental. So yesterday at council was the first read for a startup Atlanta ordinance. And that will say that any startup within the technology space will not have to pay an occupational tax. This is the first time the city's ever done that. We will be competing with New York, Los Angeles, Ohio, just have similar type, everyone is a little bit different. But really what it is, is how do we promote and attract these startup uh, companies that can be the future gazelles or the future job growth facility. So it's really little things that may make a difference to write a cr trying to create that community. Um, the other thing we did is we passed an ordinance where you, if you're uh, um, in that demonstration phase, so anyone here who has a new business, or I'm sure you know someone who knows someone that's starting a, a company, if you want to test your product on city facilities, you will now be able to do that. So if you think about the city in non-traditional terms, we have access to the airport, we have access to the police, we have fire, we have parks, we have libraries. If you have a product where you're in that demonstration phase and you want to test out your product on that on our facility, you will now be able to do it. Again, these are not rocket, they're not going to be big changes, but the fact is we're trying to change the mindset of how we are engaging and really welcoming startups and, and new millennials to, to the city of Atlanta. And so these are new initiatives, we'll see where they go and hopefully they start to create a bigger community and attract that make the city cool which is why you know there's this whole thing about giving forward and the social impact it's more than just the sidewalks and the streets it's what is my city doing for me and how are they giving back to, to the community and I think that's the trying to vibe that we're trying to create as well which is a little bit more intangible so beyond just the Millennials that we've talked about a lot is obviously the baby boomers and I think an interesting trend there uh, for the most part, you've had five years of pent-up demand where baby boobers haven't been moving because in many cases they were underwater in the value of their house. And so that pent-up demand is now there, and they're now wanting to make that downsizing move in many cases. And an interesting trend that we're seeing is with the difficulty in financing condos, particularly what they, that demographic group would want, which is larger condo units, uh, we're seeing a huge increase in baby boomers becoming essentially first-time renters. So they've been in ownership for the past 20, 30 years, and now they're saying, you know what, I'll keep my house at the lake or in the mountains, and I'm just going to, my in-town place is going to be an apartment. Totally turnkey, maintenance-free, I don't have to worry about it. So a shift there in developers starting to recognize that audience and understanding what they have to build for that group. And I think we'll see a lot more, whether it's age-targeted or age-restricted, but 55-plus apartment communities throughout the metro. Um, you know, one thing we're telling our clients about is don't forget what just happened. I mean, we just went through a, you know, a, a severe downturn where the fundamentals got totally out of whack. Atlanta's back. You know, we're adding jobs at a good clip. But don't get out ahead of yourselves. You know, we, we, we have several banks that are clients. We always tell them, you know, don't, be careful with your underwriting. 
Make sure the developer has some skin in the game. Don't always assume that rents are going to grow at 5% a year like they have been doing. Just use common sense and use reason. We have a tendency to forget in the real estate business what we just went through. And we always like to remind our clients that, hey, you know, real estate is a cyclical business. When times are good is when you really need to be careful and be cautious. And um, so that's what we like to, to tell people is just use your common sense and don't forget what happened. Well, I think that is a, a nice way to wrap us up. Good advice for all of us. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel. Um, thank you for having us. It was, it was great to be with you all. Um, I'll do a little plug for a couple of ULI programs coming up. We're going to be looking at the impact between urban investment and public education. Um, it'll be March 18th at the new North Atlanta High School. So sort of a different aspect of how education impacts real estate. And then in April, we'll be doing a joint program with AIA, uh, Good Design is Good Business. Um, so how architecture impacts returns and, and uh, where there are evidence of uh, design really having a contribution to the bottom line. So I hope you can join us. Thanks for having us.